Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good day to you all. Uh, I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person in Washington, but it is an honour and a privilege to have been asked to deliver this lecture by Charlie, Judge Brower. Uh, I feel we've known each other for a very long time, but in truth, for most of that, I was always rather in awe of him as I appeared as counsel before him on, on various cases in, in both the commercial and investment arbitration fields. Charlie was always very kind and greatly encouraging of my efforts, if a little more probing than I really would have wanted on occasions in testing my case. But I learned a great deal from him, uh, much of which has been particularly useful. Now I've crossed the table and become an arbitrator myself. So I was delighted when he uh, invited me to deliver this lecture. That said, I'm acutely conscious that we are living in a time of great geopolitical tension and arguably even a transition to a new world order. There will no doubt be much discussion and debate at the conference on the international law implications of, of current events and the need to uphold the rule of law, uh, seen perhaps more vividly to some of us now than ever before. Globalization, which has been a, a catalyst, I think, for much of the development of international arbitration, had already been the subject of some criticism but now we see it being pushed and pulled in several ways. And I, for one, find it hard to predict what will emerge when the dust settles. I imagine not many of you read The Straits Times, our local newspaper in Singapore, but I was struck by two recent headlines, which seemed to, to me at least to exemplify the current uncertainty. One was asking the now familiar question, whether we are witnessing the end of globalization. And the other, just a few days earlier, reporting our Prime Minister, Li Shen Lung, arguing that globalization still has a lot going for it. On any view, these are somewhat confusing and unsettling times. But in this lecture, I'm gonna focus closer to home, not on world perspectives, but on those of a, a practitioner who spent her entire career in the field of international arbitration, first as counsel and now as arbitrator. Much has been said and written about the psychology of arbitral decision-making and all the, the influences and biases to which we as human beings are often subconsciously exposed. But my talk will take a more empirical approach and my remarks are an amalgam of personal views and observations Gary gathered over the years. They reflect both my experiences as counsel and the rather different perspective which I now have as an arbitrator, as well as my impressions from interactions with other tribunal members. I'm going to focus on things that I think, with hindsight, I might have benefited from paying more attention to when I was acting as counsel. And that's really another way of saying that none of this is rocket science, but hopefully it will provide some insights into the thinking of tribunal members uh, and thereby be of assistance to those of you who present cases, or at least perhaps give you some pause for thought as you go about your task. Of course, uh, arbitrators are not a homogenous group, but I believe my own experiences are fairly typical. So my observations may well resonate with others who've assumed the arbitrator role. Uh, indeed, for the arbitrators in the audience, whether you agree or not with my views on the issues I'm going to be discussing, it's still, I think, a healthy discussion for us all to have. I inevitably, I suppose, I am more constrained than I would ideally like to be in terms of giving explicit examples, and none of my comments should be construed as relating to any current matter before me. But I can say that my observations are based on real cases and actual experiences. Just a little bit of context for you. <clears throat> Let me start with uh, perhaps a, just a, a quick background. So I spent nearly 35 years with the global law firm Allen & Overy, starting in London in 1983 as an article clerk, as we were then called. I joined the litigation department of the firm on qualification two years later. I then spent the next several decades enjoying the cut and thrust 
of acting as counsel. I would estimate that arbitration was probably something north of about 95% of my practice over the years. So it was clearly uh, very much the focus of my, my efforts. It's right that in the early days, the arbitrations were entirely in the commercial sphere. Um, although um, I would also comment that very often they also mimics in the early days, the English court procedure. <clears throat> but my practice evolved with the, the globalization of commerce, the growth of international arbitration to deal with cross-border disputes. And what really attracted me to practice was the prospect of arguing cases before tribunals that were made up of lawyers and academics and jurists from all over the world, developing also as I went, a greater appreciation of how others approached both procedural and legal issues. Um, I, it was one of the things I found very uh, interesting and, and rewarding about the practice that as you developed, you learned a lot more about how there were other ways to do things other than how you'd been taught. Uh, and also that in some cases, they actually had a lot going for them and were arguably better than uh, the way you had been brought up doing things. So that was really what, what drew me to the practice. And as it went along, I also sprouted a new offshoot, which was the investment treaty arbitrations, starting with what I understand was the first ever energy charter treaty case back in 2001. And then over the next 15 years or so, investment arbitration really became a, an increasingly important part of my practice. I think like many counsel who practice arbitration, I had a small stream of arbitrator appointments which were fitted in between my casework. They were generally, generally relatively small commercial cases. That was pretty well all I could get through the law firm conflicts regime. But eventually time came when I felt it was right to make a permanent move to the other side of the arbitration table and become a full-time arbitrator. Now, four years since that transition, and perhaps due to the, in part to my being based in Singapore, my practice as an arbitrator has reverted predominantly to commercial disputes rather than investment arbitration, although uh, I still do both uh, types of work. Which brings me to the subject of this lecture. I think I can now make a more informed reflection on the contrast between the roles of counsel and arbitrator uh, and how they approach the arbitration process from somewhat different viewpoints. I also realized that the, the perspective I had of the arbitrator role when I was counsel was in some respects rather different from how I see things today. So I wanted to take the opportunity of this lecture to share some thoughts uh, and reflections on those different perspectives. Uh, in some respects, I would say being an arbitrator is entirely as I expected, a more measured existence in many ways where the highs are not so high and the lows are not so low, uh, but nevertheless immensely uh, rewarding as you work to get on top of a case uh, and understand the parties' respective positions and then, of course, reach your determination. I actually thought if I was no longer cross-examining, I might lose something of the art of probing questions, but it, it appears not, because now when I ask almost anything of counsel, they usually start their answer by telling me what a great question it is. But seriously, uh, I think articulating your, your reasoning in, this, in an award it is one of the most satisfying aspects of the job. But before you get to that, the case has to be managed through the different preparatory stages. It can be challenging uh, as you seek to shepherd the parties through the process and try to keep it all on track for a timely resolution. I never really expected to see the equivalent of, of Charles Dickens's fictional Jarndyce and Jarndyce, but in one case, I was appointed as wing at a time when the arbitration was in its ninth year. It still had not got to completion of the final oral hearings 
uh, when I was appointed. And as I, I read through the history of the proceedings uh, in which each of the original three tribunal members had uh, at different stages needed to be replaced, it served as a cautionary reminder of quite how important it is for the tribunal to keep the process moving forward and on track towards uh, the final goal of, of delivering an award. I'm going to try and avoid getting into the usual arbitrator gripes about procedural issues. <clears throat> you all know your submissions are way too long and that arbitrators get frustrated by parties squabbling over minor issues. I may not be entirely successful, but I will try instead uh, to look more at how substantively cases are presented and what, from the arbitrator's perspective, I see as some of the, the, the issues and, and the difficulties that, that arise. But before getting into the detail of that, I think there are a couple of fairly obvious but important overarching points that it, it's worth making at the outset. And the first is that as an arbitrator, your raison d'etre, your purpose in life, is the production of a, a valid, binding and enforceable award in which you determine the issues in the case. And from the tribunal's perspective, everything else really is geared towards enabling you to achieve that goal. All the procedural back and forth as the case progresses, all those delightful red fern schedules, even the hearing itself, which for counsel is often the culmination of many weeks, if not months of really intensive effort, for your tribunal, they are all primarily steps along the path to the award as the culmination of the tribunal's substantive decision-making. <clears throat> and I accept that on one level, of course, this is true for all participants. Everybody wants an award at the end of the day. But I do think there is a difference in perspective of the process of how you get there. The, the intensity of effort required from counsel at each stage is such that inevitably there's a sense of purpose and achievement in reaching the individual milestones, whether that be service of a memorial with all its accompanying evidence and authorities, usually at uh, an ungodly hour of the day or night, um, or whether it's sending out the final transfer of disclosure, and, and perhaps especially reaching the end of a grueling week uh, or more of oral hearings. But for the tribunal, the primary task at hand is to assimilate everything you read and hear, sorting the salient from the irrelevant and reaching a coherently reasoned evidentially sound and legally sustainable result. Of course, there may be a need for substantive decision making along the way if the parties need some form of interim relief, which the party, which the tribunal has to do its best to resolve, despite inevitably perhaps it having a, a somewhat incomplete picture of the broader merits of the case. But putting that on one side, for your tribunal, what they're really focused on, their holy grail is how this will all play out in the award that they have got to write. And that will inform their thinking and their approach to the case and what they want from you as counsel. In short, they want you to get to the point and to explain the relevance of what you're doing or convey it to the tribunal. And that's why they get grumpy if they think you're wasting time on things that don't really matter. Again, let me give you an example. As a tribunal member, I sat through a day, a full day of very technical expert evidence on a particular issue in a construction case. The only relevance of it was agreed to be whether the issue addressed had caused delay to the project. The tribunal then asked the delay experts of both sides if the subject of that technical evidence formed part of their analysis. And both said no, because they agreed it wasn't on the critical path. Again, clearly not a useful uh, way to spend 
the tribunal's time and the limited time available for hearings. But the key point I'm, I'm making here is to suggest uh, that you always try and bear in mind and tailor your approach to the fact that your tribunal will be looking at the case through the prism of its decision-making role. So try and focus on what is truly relevant. I fully accept that the tribunal has a part to play in achieving that. Uh, of course they do, but there is a balance to be struck and as a tribunal, we cannot tell you how to put your case or indeed interfere uh, too much with the way you choose to put it. But we will thank you for helping us by focusing on what matters. And if you want your argument to be adopted in the award, I suggest you avoid diatribe and deliver the sort of reasoned analysis that your tribunal might be persuaded to endorse. And I'll come back to this a little later in the, in the lecture. The second overarching point is a reminder that uh, your tribunal will be looking at the case objectively and from a position of neutrality. That's what parties want. And it's why as a community, we focus so much on independence and impartiality of the tribunal. You want arbitrators who are genuinely neutral to decide your case. Uh, and I have actually felt this to be one of the more liberating factors in my new role. I'm not trying to argue for one side or another because as an arbitrator, it makes no difference to me who wins the case. But alongside that neutrality, comes an objectivity of approach, which for counsel engaged can uh, sometimes become a little obscured. And from what I have seen, this is uh, often most pronounced in relation to witnesses appearing for cross-examination, perhaps influenced by months, if not years of developing and articulating a, a case theory with which the witness, uh, when examined, perhaps takes issue Council can sometimes barely conceal their scepticism or outright disbelief of the testimony given. But the tribunal will not think a witness is being dishonest or even economical with the truth, simply because they take a different view or have a different perspective or a different recollection of events. Rather, your tribunal will look objectively at the plausibility of the evidence. And even if the tribunal ultimately decides to reject the evidence, it doesn't necessarily mean they will conclude that the witness is deliberately lying. Of course, they might be, uh, and the tribunal will likely not be slow to say so if it feels that it's been knowingly misled uh, by a witness. But the key point here is I think counsel is perhaps sometimes all too ready to jump to the conclusion that a witness is being dishonest, whereas an arbitrator is much less ready to do so, absent compelling evidence of dishonesty. In short, viewed through the lens of an arbitrator, most cases don't have good guys and bad guys. They have differing views and interests and behavior, which falls one side of the line or the other of what's legally permissible. Another um, perhaps more frequent example is the common refrain from counsel that something makes no sense or makes no commercial sense. And this can be a very powerful submission, but it's one that falls remarkably flat if your tribunal's perhaps more objective viewpoint is that there is a tenable explanation or rationale if things perhaps aren't quite as uh, you as counsel perceive them to be. And ultimately, I suppose the message is to remember that your tribunal is open-minded and will not share your client's inevitably partisan view of events. You won't persuade the tribunal by mere assertion and certainly not by overreaching or exaggeration of the strength of your position. Even if they don't interrupt your submissions to pick you up on it at the time, you won't be 
achieving your goal if you adopt that approach. And as, as arbitrators, we are also uh, all too familiar with counsel who give equal impassioned weight and indeed time to both good and bad points alike. And this prime wolf, if you will, may even obscure uh, the overall merits of your position. It's far better, if you can, to try and put yourself in the shoes of the neutral, looking for explication and striving to understand what has occurred. Now, these are very uh, general comments. So I will now move to focus uh, on three areas for more granular observations. And I'm gonna start uh, with some thoughts on the use of memorials and what I see as one of the major pitfalls. This is closely related to the second area, which I'll address on how legal issues in the case are presented and the need to ensure that they get the attention that they deserve. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to give a perspective on, of the arbitrator's view on how council tackle the inevitable difficult issues that arise uh, on the case, what I would call the good, the bad, and the ugly ways of handling, handling the, the challenging issues that your cases throw up. So let me start with uh, what I will refer to as the memorial elephant trap. And I, I should perhaps make clear at the outset that uh, memorials were uh, and are in many ways my preferred approach to submissions both as counsel and as arbitrator. There is something very satisfying about presenting a complete, coherent, cross-referenced submission with all its evidence attached. Uh, and equally in receiving such a package, rather than what is sometimes more of a teaser document to be followed uh, some months later by, by witness testimony, and possibly even later still by sight of uh, some of the documents to be relied upon, the significance of which may not even be revealed until very close to the oral hearing. But I think the, the elephant trap I refer to can result from the use of memorials uh, as a vehicle to tell a story. And the risk is that the, the urge to tell that story overtakes and replaces the need or the focus perhaps on careful legal analysis of the elements of the claim or defense. Of course, I acknowledge that not all cases require delving into a detailed analysis of the applicable law and your tribunal may already uh, have detailed knowledge of the relevant area of law uh, and may indeed have been chosen precisely because of that um, you don't need to explain to Judge Brower what Article 31.1 of the Vienna Convention says or describe for him what the Cellini criteria are. But equally, I, I think it's important to recognise that there are a substantial number of cases, the outcome of which will depend upon the tribunal's findings with regard to the applicable law and whether the requirements for the particular cause of action have been established cases where there's a, a dispute between the parties as to the applicable legal principles, uh, and the claim will stand or fall uh, on whether the tribunal accepts one party's reasoning or the other party's reasoning. And to my mind, it's those cases where the danger lies. And yeah, I recognize some will argue that, that most cases turn on, on the facts, not the law. But I would suggest that's perhaps an oversimplification because your tribunal are always going to have to focus on the law as part of their decision making, even if it might not be the most contentious aspect uh, of the particular case. But in others, it will be. And with that in mind, uh, I'm struck by the fact that the focus of memorials often seems to be primarily on delivering a compelling factual narrative designed to vindicate the client's position and condemn that of the other party. And, and 
it's 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 almost formulaic the way a, a claimant will describe how it has been wronged or excluded or caused harm by unreasonable, unlawful, unwarranted behavior of the respondent. And then in turn, the respondent will explain how it was entirely justified in its actions. They were proportionate, a direct response to the appalling behavior of the claimant as set out in its counterclaims. Adjectives abound, egregious, appalling, shocking, grievous, shameful, blatant, and so on. Uh, and the clients love it. Um, and the emphasis on getting across their side of the story is what they want to hear. And, and that is understandable. Your clients want their version of events to be heard. And you want to win the hearts and minds of the tribunal, right? Persuade them that your clients are the victims of the peace, whichever side you're acting for, uh, and encourage the tribunal to see that they have a duty to provide or reject recourse. Well, that's all fine up to a point, but of course, arbitrators have to look beyond this, that objectivity kicking in again. And what I've seen happen with this approach, which I've sort of slightly glibly de described uh, as the back and forth, but what I have seen happen is that so much attention is given to getting the story across, that it comes at the expense of a rigorous legal analysis. Council getting so wrapped up in their narrative of wrongdoing that they fail properly to consider the requirements of the legal case that they're seeking to advance. And that can, of course, be fatal because no matter how convincing the storyline or how sympathetic the tribunal might be, it must ultimately be provided with a legally coherent and persuasive route to its determination, assuming the parties haven't agreed on ex equo bodo or some other formulation. But generally speaking, the tribunal has to look for a legal route to its determination. And an account of mistreatment, however compelling, isn't enough to ensure that there'll be redress. Indeed, if the tribunal is left scratching their heads as to what your legal case is, because it's hidden in a morass of prejudicial ranting, your memorial is not going to achieve its purpose. Let me give you some examples of the sort of thing I, I have in, in mind, uh, where I have seen the, the, the legal analysis being, in my view, neglected and I suppose the examples are necessarily quite specific, but just, just to name a few, the fraud claim where the successful party affirms the contract, but seeks damages on the basis of restoring the parties to the position they would have been in had the contract never been entered into. The claim for expropriation, where the asset remains operational and under the full use and control of the claimant. The shareholder claiming on behalf of the company it owns against third parties uh, for losses which the applicable law permits only the company to claim. And the claim which jumps from the wrongdoing to proof of loss without addressing the crucial causation steps in between, or indeed in some cases even addressing a, a proper articulation of the alleged breach. What's struck me about these and, and other examples I've encountered is that all of these cases involved a really forceful and passionate factual narrative of alleged wrongdoing. And I've therefore been left with a sense of counsel becoming so preoccupied with the facts that the legal basis of the claim doesn't get the attention it deserves. As seems almost invariably to be the case, the legal analysis comes only at the back end of the memorial, uh, but that, I suggest, does not detract from its importance, especially for your tribunal, who are going to approach their decision making uh, on a basis that has to focus on the legal framework and the elements necessary to support any award. This 
lack of rigor can can actually also I've, I've, I've observed uh, can often be exemplified by arguing for the application of a very broad range of legal theories, regardless of whether they are truly sustainable on the facts of the case. Presumably, the idea is to give the tribunal lots of alternatives to choose from. But I, I do think there is merit in the saying less is more and an eclectic approach to pleading can not only detract from its effectiveness, but it also seems to me somehow to give counsel a false sense of security that there must be a valid claim in there somewhere because they've managed to put forward so many different options. I see that frequently in the commercial context, but I would also ask rhetorically, how often are claims based on full protection security and national treatment standards thrown into the mix in treaty claims when they really add nothing to the principal claims of fair and equitable treatment uh, or expropriation. Let me turn then to the second uh, point that I wanted to focus on, uh, and it's, it's very much related, uh, and that is the issue of how we develop legal argument in the course of an arbitration. Uh, this is a subject about which I have had reservations for some time, uh, which I raised in an essay in 2015 as a contribution to the publication, which was celebrating Charlie's 80th birthday. Uh, some of you may re remember it. It was called Practicing Virtue Inside International Arbitration. And the, the issue uh, about development of legal argument arises because it's now frequently delivered in the form of written submissions with little, if any, opportunity in practice for detailed oral exchanges with the tribunal. The use of legal expert witnesses has, I perceive at least, declined uh, in favour of counsel arguing the relevant law by way of submission and with the credibility of doing so, uh, often enhanced by the addition to the council team of a lawyer qualified in the relevant jurisdiction. And in the investment arbitration sphere, academic experts on public international law that uh, sometimes retained as part of the council team. And even if uh, it's a case where you have expert evidence on the legal issues adduced by way of witness testimony, I've certainly experienced that cross-examination seems in practice quite frequently to be dispensed, of, dispensed with. So uh, as a result, uh, the development of legal argument at the hearing seems to me at least to have waned somewhat. Hearings are increasingly focused instead on the examination of, of, of witnesses. Uh, indeed, they're often betrayingly described as evidentiary hearings. Uh, and that, of course, is the nomenclature adopted in the, the hugely influential IBA rules of evidence, which focus on the presentation of documentary and especially witness evidence, with uh, no specific mention in the rules of the presentation of legal argument. Now, that's not a criticism of uh, the IBA rules. Uh, those rules are very clear as to their focus on the taking of evidence. But to me, it is instructive that we've developed this widely adopted set of procedures for dealing with evidence, right down to detail of the sequence of appearances of witnesses at hearings. But yet we have no explicit similar mechanism for dealing with the legal issues in the case. In, in some ways, also for me, the, the, the focus on, on witness evidence is itself a slightly intriguing development, as those who decry the, the relevance of legal argument uh, on the basis that, it is, that most cases turn on the facts will probably also tell you that witness evidence is notoriously unreliable and can be given little weight. Now, that's not a criticism of the IBA rules. Those rules are clear as to their focus on the taking of evidence. But it is perhaps instructive that we've developed this widely adopted set of procedures for dealing with evidence, right down to 
sequencing of appearances of witnesses at the hearings. But yet we have no explicit mechanism or guidelines that have been widely adopted uh, for dealing with the legal issues in the case. And whether or how that's to be done has to be addressed on a case by case basis. And in some ways, I think that the focus on witness evidence is itself um, a slightly intriguing development because those who decry the relevance of legal argument on the basis that most cases turn on the facts uh, will probably also tell you that witness evidence is notoriously unreliable uh, and can be given little weight. Nevertheless, I think, uh, I think we, we could probably all agree that despite the legal analysis being a key part of the tribunal's award, the battle for airtime, at least at, at hearings, seems to largely have been won by witness evidence. Now, wearing my arbitrator hat and perhaps influenced by what I've described earlier uh, about the memorial system, meaning that the legal base of the claims is not always given the close attention it deserves. Um, I have come to the view that it, it is actually worth giving further thought and further attention to how uh, best to fit the legal argument within the arbitration process, at least in those cases where it's likely to be a significant factor in the tribunal's decision making. Uh, and again, reflecting on the memorial style submissions, uh, they very much encourage legal argument being canvassed in writing um, and often with citation to a wealth of legal authorities. There's often no limit on the extent of the written argument uh, and it may run to hundreds of pages. Uh, and we then have the sequential exchange of memorials, which can often mean that by the time the case actually reaches a hearing, the tribunal will have received the equivalent of uh, a short novel or perhaps a not so short novel. No wonder then you might think that the, the common approach to effective case management is to treat that as sufficient without the need for legal argument at the oral hearing. But I think what that means is there's very little interaction with the tribunal regarding what it considers to be the relevant legal issues in the case, with the parties effectively being left to identify and explore and then analyze them. Council get to determine what legal issues are to be canvassed and how they're to be addressed with really very little feedback from the tribunal. And in, in practice, it, it's relatively unusual for the tribunal to have much say in the matter uh, until they get to the point of asking for certain issues to be addressed in the post hearing briefs, which again, often just leads to more written submissions. Now, in, I recognize in this approach, as I, I mentioned earlier, it may be that the parties are relying in part at least on the tribunal's existing familiarity with that area of law. But I do think it's worth reflecting on whether all arbitrators really can be said to have sufficient knowledge or understanding of the law applicable to the case. If, for example, it involves a jurisdiction other than that from which they came and in which they were trained, uh, and perhaps even a completely different system of law. If, if, if that's the, the situation, one has to ask, is it sufficient that they just get written submissions, but little or no discussion or opportunity to, to question what's being put before them? Indeed, even if they are familiar with the applicable law, as I heard one very senior retired judge recently put it, it's in the areas you think you know best where you're most likely to make a mistake. And I, I think there's some truth in that. Interestingly, I think the issue is actually less pressing in the context of more traditional pleading style of arbitration proceedings. There, the parties serve short formal pleadings, setting out their respective cases, including the legal basis of the claim or defence, followed separately and subsequently by the documents and witness evidence. But the written articulation of legal argument at that stage, at least, is often in fairly skeletal form, setting out the principles contended for, 
but without detailed analysis. That comes later uh, in the form of pre-hearing summaries. But perhaps because it has previously received more limited attention, uh, it's not uncommon in my experience for more time than to be set aside for legal submissions to be given orally at the hearing, either in rather lengthier openings or sometimes in oral closings. Uh, and that leads to a greater level of interaction on these matters with the tribunal. Another aspect of this uh, concerns how helpful these lengthy written legal submissions in the memorial really are to the tribunal. They're often carefully crafted uh, and may advance some fairly tightly worded propositions, which ultimately turn out to be of little assistance because they address a distorted version of the relevant principles, for example, uh, what some call straw man arguments, or they may be superficially persuasive, but ultimately will not withstand detailed scrutiny, uh, or they may simply be filled with obfuscation. The reality is that an uninhibited scope for written argument can on occasions induce a lack of focus or a failure to apply intellectual rigor to that uh, written submission and to the analysis that's, that's contained in it. And I personally feel that that is all the more so when counsel knows that they're never actually gonna be called upon to look the tribunal, tribunal in the eye and orally defend the positions taken. Now, for those of you who, who think I'm underestimating the intellectual firepower of most uh, arbitrators, I would suggest think about it this way. That arbitrator may have trained in a particular jurisdiction and most of their career may have focused on arguing cases based on that applicable law. They, they may be diligent about keeping up to date with significant legal developments and they may even have done a case or two within the last few years that involved that particular area of law. But for all that, they still need to grapple with the specific legal concepts and principles applicable to the case. They may know them well, but they may not. So how does it typically play out? Well, the arbitrator will read your submissions in preparation for the hearing. Uh, and if it's an area of law that they're familiar with, they will probably do so quite quickly because they've still got hundreds more pages of other material to read. They may focus on some points which need elaboration, not least to make sure they understand the legal case being presented and, and the reasons why the parties dispute each other's legal analysis. But then you come to the oral hearing and we have opening submissions where they might be able to put the odd question but generally speaking, uh, legal argument usually gets little, if any, attention during the opening submissions. And there may not even be any oral opening submissions. Uh, and certainly that's true of oral closing submissions. So, as I said earlier, the, the, really the primary opportunity for the input on the legal issues by the tribunal appears to me at least to come primarily when they start putting their questions to be addressed in the post-hearing briefs, which I think we can probably agree is a relatively late stage in the proceedings. And I think my point is that even at the oral hearing, the rubber doesn't really hit the road on this. There's a risk that that actually only happens when the arbitrators come to put pen to paper to write their award. It's at that stage they have to focus in detail on the legal issues in order that they can then articulate their reasoning for deciding one way or another. The parties may have put in some written submissions but otherwise effectively ignored it up to that point. But the tribunal must then focus. And at that point, of course, they have to do so on the basis of the materials in front of them, on the basis of the papers that they've been given. The alternative, if they find something lacking, is to reopen particular matters for clarification or elaboration. But that inevitably leads to delay 
and possibly even suggestions of a due process infringement because the tribunal is said to be unfairly allowing one or other party a second bite at the apple in terms of making good their case. Unsurprising then that tribunals are generally speaking fairly reluctant to go down this path uh, and instead work with the materials that they've got. I can imagine a ready response to these remarks is to suggest that tribunals should get their act together earlier in the piece so that they can ascertain if there are aspects of the respective legal cases they want more interactive debate or discussion about. Surely they have the powers to ensure that they can they can test the legal arguments presented and, and recalibrate the focus of the hearing if that's what they think appropriate. I do see the force of that point, and of course, there have been efforts to introduce procedural devices to assist the tribunal in, if you will, taking a deeper dive uh, into the issues of the case at an earlier stage, uh, the Kaplan openings, the Reed retreats, for example. But in truth, these have yet to become common or uh, even widely accepted practices, uh, and there seems to be little or no pressure uh, from the parties or, in truth, many tribunals for their adoption. I think there's also the need for something of a reality check here. The council teams on substantial cases will often be very large and the tasks will be meted out in a way which enables detailed focus on particular aspects of the case by different subgroups, each of which takes responsibility for mastering their particular area of the case. Arbitrators don't have that luxury. Even if they have agreed in advance, who will take the lead on writing different sections of the award? It's incumbent on all of them to get across the entire case so that they can provide effective input into the deliberation process. And of course, they're all responsible for the award in toto uh, that results from the case. So your tribunal will be trying to do their best to get across the, the whole of the case and take it all in. And as each memorial arrives, usually several months apart, they will be building their knowledge and understanding of the case. But they have to absorb what is often a vast amount of material. So it's perhaps not altogether surprising that an issue with or gap in the legal reasoning which a party may also, of course, have been trying throughout to paper over, may become apparent only when the tribunal seek to pull it all together in the form of a reasoned award. So what's the answer? Well, uh, I can't pretend to have a magic solution. As I say, there are procedural mechanisms which may help um, and perhaps we should use more. But I do think it, Part of the problem comes back to the fact that our arbitral procedures often take a familiar form without always recognising fully the particular features of the case. And it, it seems to me there could be benefits all round from a more targeted approach to identifying those cases where the law is a matter of real contention between the parties or where the case raises complex or novel legal issues with which the tribunal may not already be familiar. If that's done, then more careful consideration can be given to when and how the legal analysis is to be developed, and for this to be done on a more bespoke and, and indeed collaborative basis, which engages the tribunal uh, as well as the parties. And I suppose what I would say is as counsel, if it really matters for your case, maybe you should be pressing for more airtime at the hearing to discuss the legal issues. Which brings me to the final topic for today, uh, which is the treatment of what I would call difficult issues and the good, the bad and the ugly way of doing so. I think by definition, every party in every case has to deal with difficult points. Otherwise, if it was all very straightforward, the case would almost certainly have settled somewhere along the course uh, and it would never have come before the arbitrators. There might be difficult uh, be facts that are difficult to reconcile with your case theory or unhelpful documents, 
uh, or legal authorities which undermine your argument. Hopefully not all three, but yes, sometimes you might face all three. As arbitrators, we understand this. We know you will have strong points and weak points to your case. We also understand that as counsel, you want to focus on the points where you're stronger and can confidently denigrate the other side's case. Good counsel also know, however, that they have to deal with the difficult points too. Uh, and the aim will often be to persuade the tribunal that they're not really weak points at all, uh, or have been exaggerated or misunderstood by the other side. It can, I think, sometimes be frustrating for counsel that when it comes to the oral hearing uh, or the questions posed by the tribunal to be answered in, in post-hearing briefs or, or oral closings, the tribunal often seem to show a, a disproportionate degree of interest in the more challenging points of your case. And they are the ones uh, that seem to really interest the tribunal. That's not the tribunal being mean. It's because they genuinely want your help to understand how you say they should deal with the more challenging aspects of your case when it comes to writing the award. The tribunal will likely have grasped many, even if not all, of your weak spots from the written submissions. And the hearing is their opportunity to explore them with you because, as we've said, they will be thinking about, well, how am I going to deal with these aspects of the argument when it comes to writing my award? And as a result, inevitably, your arguments and explanations may have a significant impact on the outcome of the case, which means that the stakes are often high. So what should you do? Well, I think there are a variety of approaches and, and of course the best response will depend on what the particular point is, how relevant it is and so on. Uh, and this isn't the occasion for a micro analysis of how to deal with difficult issues. But there are what as an arbitrator, I would call good response techniques, bad response techniques and yeah, ugly responses. So what's the good? I think it's, the, it's effectively the marginalization of the point to the tribunal's key decision making, or perhaps better still, the explanation of why the tribunal should consider it irrelevant. It's the highlighting of evidence and uh, the development of argument to show that what seemed clear cut and quite negative for you is actually more nuanced and has to be seen in a, a broader or depending on your case, a narrower context. It's the demonstration of an alternative perspective. All very case specific and easier said than done, I know, which is probably why we have the bad way of dealing with the difficult points. Those challenging issues where the best answer you can find doesn't actually even convince you, let alone the tribunal. So instead, counsel tries to ignore the issue or its implications for the case. Uh, often by attempting to get the discussion back onto areas where the case has a stronger foundation. But dealing with a, a tribunal question by answering a different, less uncomfortable question may be uh, one technique that counsel will choose to adopt, or they'll respond on a tangential point whilst avoiding the thrust of the point which underlies the question on the difficult issue. The problem with those devices is that for your tribunal, well, first, it's obviously a bit irritating when counsel doesn't answer the question, but perhaps more importantly, the tribunal will assume you have no answer and they will recall that when it comes to writing the award. I think as counsel, I was always a little skeptical of those who said that they really liked it when tribunal asked, tribunals ask lots of questions. I can't say I really liked it that much, uh, but from where I sit now, I would encourage you to think of tribunal questions as genuine attempts to understand how you want us to deal with some of the trickier points. It's fine to take time to reflect, uh, and often the questions can be responded to in writing, but don't duck them unless you really don't have anything to say, because it will likely come back to bite you. 
Which brings me to my third category, or what I will call the ugly way of dealing with difficult issues. What do I mean by that? Uh, I suppose it comes down to council seeking effectively to hoodwink the tribunal. The most common is the misquotation or mischaracterization of the record, like giving citations which are incomplete and omit the relevant text, which then distorts the thrust of the passage relied upon, like footnoting a source which doesn't in fact support the proposition or possibly doesn't even exist, or arguing a point that, has, that, that, that a point has been established by the evidence when in fact it was the subject of some unsupported conjecture by that party's own expert. Or that's relying on a statement in a legal authority, which in fact form part of counsel's argument rather than the court or tribunal's findings, and so on. Uh, we've all seen these sorts of things and, count, and counsel will often pick up if the other side do it. But obviously, unless there are reply post-hearing briefs, then uh, there may not be an opportunity for the other side to do so. But the arbitrators uh, will uh, study the post-hearing briefs very carefully. Obviously, by definition, as an arbitrator, you don't know how many of these little tricks you miss. But we do check and we do follow through to the source material. Uh, and so my advice is never allow yourself to be tempted to go down this path. Not that I can guarantee you would be found out every time, but I can say that there is little an arbitrator finds more irritating than the sense that counsel is trying to dupe them by being less than frank in the way they're presenting the evidence uh, or their argument. So let me try and conclude from this wide range of, of uh, topics that we've looked at. Uh, I've tried to share this assortment of, of thoughts and observations derived from my practice, uh, which hopefully arbitrators will have found give some points of commonality. Uh, but for the council among you, obviously, this is not an instructional video. There's no magic sequence of steps to make the process work for you. But I do hope that at least what I've said may make you reflect of on the perspective of your tribunal and help you to shape what you do in a way that will help them and thereby also help you and your clients. Thank you very much.